Hello guys, welcome back. So today in this module, as you can see, I'm going to discuss about acute myeloid leukemias. We already discussed about acute leukemias, the lymphoid neoplasm in the previous module, right? So what we saw was we saw about the blast percentage criteria. We know about the investigation modalities, the approach, when to do for a bone marrow biopsy or an aspirate, how the needles will look. We also know the basics about flow cytomet, right? So with all those basic concepts, I'm going to apply them into myeloid neoplasms. And we also know that from the first chapter, myeloid has common myeloid progenitor, just multiple lineages like granulocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, lots of them, right? So with all those inputs, let's go and read about acute myeloid leukemias. If you're ready for the game as usual, put on a smile and let's start. So about acute leukemias, acute myeloid leukemias to be specific. So AML, as usual, it has the same criteria, okay? I don't have any problem in the criteria of AML. It's the same, blast percentage is the same. I should have more than or equal to 20% blast in PS or in the bone marrow, okay? So that remains the same. That's the first part. So, but there's a only slight twist that this blast percentage has a few exceptions. For us, exceptions are always MCQs, right? There are lots of MCQs in and around, wound in and around the exceptions, right? So what do I mean by that is, I don't require 20% blast in a few situations. When I have few classical translocations, for example, if a person has translocation 8, 21, translocation 15, 17, translocation 16, 16, or I can call it an inversion 16, right? So when I have either of these three, see it should be either of these, I don't want all of them, right? Either of these three, the blast percentage is not required. I can relax the blast percentage, right? That's why these are exceptions. As I said, exceptions are always, always important because that helps us to gauge the MCQ because see, when I, when 100 people are going to read, everyone knows the normal thing. So if some exception comes, they catch hold of the exceptions and that's where they ask you questions, right? So how it is going to be useful for me for diagnosis in real life and also in MCQ, right? Let's say, let's give an example. A patient came with a history of your petty K purpura, muscle pain and something. You investigated, CBC was a peripheral smear, you had blast. In peripheral smear, let's say there was 10% blast. As per our approach in the ALL, what we saw, should I need, do I need a bone marrow here? Yes, right. I need a bone marrow here and bone marrow said that there was 15% blast. Okay. So can I call this an acute leukemia? Acute, and they were myeloblast. Can I call them acute myeloid leukemia? I cannot, right? Because neither in peripheral smear nor in bone marrow, I don't have the 20% cutoff. The same time, this patient patient's genetics was sent and let's say that translocation 821 was found. Now, can I call it an AML? Yes, I can call it an AML. So this is where it's going to be helpful for me. So when I have a classical translocation, either one of the, these three, I don't want 20% blast. 10 is enough, 9 is enough, 8 is enough, anything. Anything is enough for me to call it an acute leukemia, provided I have blast and have there's a classical translocation present, any one of these three. That's why exceptions are important, right? So I know a little bit about the exceptions. So now, classification. What we saw in ALL was we had one L1, L2, L3 classification and B and T ALL classification, right? So here, again, I'm going to divide AML classifications into two major groups, <coughs> the WHO and the FAB, <coughs> the older FAB, right? So FAB is your French, American, British classification, which is a morphological classification. So in this morphological classification, we have something called as an AML M0. I have AML M0 till AML M7. See, this is the only classification which was there for long, long years. Then WHO came and kind of changed the classification based on the genetics and based on the etiology. So I have multiple groups. I have something called as a recurrent cytogenetic abnormalities group. I have some groups saying that AML with myelodysplastic syndrome, therapy related AML. And these morphological also comes in WHO where it's called as AML not otherwise classified, right? So I have different types of WHO classification, right? So we'll have a just quick look about WHO classification because this part is very important for us, right? So the first part for me here is AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities. See here, though it might look an exhaustive classification, it's very, very simple for us to remember because I'm going to divide them in multiple places, relearn them in a multiple way so that it creates a mind map for you, so it's easy for you. AML with recurrent cytogenetic abnormality, the easiest way to remember is the exception to the BLAST criteria. So I have here AML 
with translocation 821. So it has one important gene called as run X gene that's getting translocated here. Okay, so run X. So I have AML with my inversion 16. Inversion 16 has something called a CEBPA. That's also gene's name. If you can remember the gene, great. If not, just remember the translocation at least. Fine. So the third one here is my AML with translocation 1517. We already know. Don't worry. We'll be reading more about 1517. So I'm just leaving it here and not talking about the gene here. Right? We'll talk about the gene soon in some other place. I have your AML with translocations involving 11q chromosome 11q23 okay remember this why i want you to remember this is whenever 11q comes inside it has a poor prognosis the reason being uh, when you rem if you remember your antibiotic resistance in your bacteria there are few places where there will be drug eluting glycoproteins the bacteria will have few glycoproteins that will push the drug outside of the cell like that if you have this translocation this translocation what it does is it does the same thing to chemotherapy. It will push the chemotherapy outside. So the response to chemotherapy is very, very minimal if you have this translocation. So it has a poor prognosis, right? So these three generally has a very good prognosis. It has a favorable prognosis. Okay. The recurrent cytogenic abnormality is good for us. All of them. So this one, like I said, the reason I am having like a drug eluting lycoprotein, they have a poor prognostic factor. See, I am telling only things which are approved there are few provisional entities. I'm not going to crowd them here. Maybe in few MCQs down the road in your TNDs in the live classes, we'll discuss a lot of them, right? And there are few PYQs as well. We'll discuss there also, fine? Okay, that's my first thing. AML with recurrent cytogenetic abnormalities, clear? The second thing for me is AML with MDS-like features. MDS stands for myelodysplastic syndrome. So when I say myelodysplasia, I'm having some problem in the myeloid lineage. Not to the extent it's going to produce me 20% blast, maybe less than that, 5%, 3%, 10%, less than that. So I have AMLs with less blast criteria, not accepting for a diagnosis of an AML. I'm going to call them an MDS. So can an MDS progress to AML? It can. Or can an AML have dysplasia and other lineages, not just my myeloid? Can let's say I'm having AML in granulocyte lineage. Can erythroid become abnormal? It can, right? Because everything comes from common myeloid progenitor, right? So here, when I say AML with MDS-like features, there's a prior history of MDS that transformed to AML, that's one. Or I have AML with multilineage dysplasia, okay? So I already have AML with multilineage dysplasia. That's what I said. If I have a leukemia in your granulocyte lineage, I can have RBC dyspoiesis. I can have platelet dyspoiesis because every person comes from a common myeloid progenitor. We know the genesis, right? Third one, just remember this, AML with MDS cytogenetics. When I do cytogenetic analysis, the cytogenetics looks like a patient with the MDS, but clinically it's going to look like an AML, right? So that's what the three criteria says. Now tell me, see, I want you to analyze them and then go to the prognosis. Because if I go to prognosis without much of insight into it, I'm memorizing it. I don't want you to memorize. I had one tumor, which progress to another tumor, good or bad? Obviously bad, right? That's not rocket science behind it. Second, second thing with MDS-like features. I had a tumor in granulocyte, but unfortunately my RBC and platelets are also abnormal. Good or bad? Bad because more lineage is being involved, right? The second entire category with MDS-like thing will have a very, very poor prognosis. Because there is more than one tumor pathogen is involved here, Obviously, it's going to take a toll on the patient and definitely it'll have a poor prognosis, right? Third, in third group, we're going to call it an AML therapy related. <clears throat> this therapy related AML, see any therapy related AML again will have a very, very poor prognosis. I'll tell you why this is important. See, when you read pharmacotherapy, uh, the alkylating agents, most of the alkylating agents are actually carcinogens. I am using them because they are low grade carcinogens, right? So you must have read when reading topotican, irnotican or etoposites. One of the side effect of topotican, irnotican or etoposite is secondary leukemia. So some of the time when I give alkylating agents as a treatment for another cancer, the patient has a cancer, 
I am trying some other random cancer, let's say a colonic cancer, I am trying to give alkylating agents, 5 fluorouracil That alkylating agent is causing mutation for me, causing leukemia for me. Because of this alkylating agent, I am having a secondary AML. So what do you talk, tell about the prognosis? Obviously poor, right? Already the patient is having one tumor. On top of that, more mutation, more tumor, right? So I have two groups in therapy related AML also. I'm not going into the details of it. It's not required for this. If I know the prognosis, more than enough for me, right? Because one group, that's topotican, erotican, and they have a different half-life, like the Latin time. The other group, etoposide related group, will have a different Latin period. Like I gave drug today, I had leukemia some five years later or some two years later, based on that video item. I'm not going into the depths of it. The last but not the least one is, like I said, AML NOS, not otherwise specified. This is where your FAB classification of <coughs> M0 to M7 comes. Okay, This is where all the FAB classification of M0 to M7 comes. So this makes our life much easier. So I am just integrating both of them. So I am just reiterating it again. Recurrent genetic abnormality, we had 3 already known one and one 11Q23 drug eluting poor. 